contrary to Hollywood, real cowboy life was less rawhide and more a million ways to die of dysentery in the desert. The life of a cowboy in the 1800s was a full plate of hard work, danger, and monotony, with a heaping helping of dust, snakes, bugs, and beans on the side. Today we're exploring what it was really like to be a cowboy in the Wild West. But before we do, partner, we reckon you mosey on over, subscribe to Weird History, turn on notifications, and leave a comment on topics you'd like to hear about. Now let's get a move on to the Old West. Yeehaw. Cowboys are called cowboys as opposed to, say, horse boys for good reason. Whether they're on a ranch or out on the uncompromising hell of the Wild West, they've got cattle on the brain morning, noon, and night. Considering the variety of nonsense that makes cowboys so entertaining to us, it pays to bear in mind that they're doing all this roping and wrestling on about six hours of sleep at best. That might actually sound like a dream to more than a few of us, but then we don't have to deal with the possibility of being eaten by coyotes, bitten by poisonous snakes, robbed by bandits, or slaughtered by Apache war parties. Or worse still, taken alive for torture. Ooh. In view of all that, cowboys generally slept in shifts of two to four hours, catching whatever rest their humble, lice-ridden bedrolls or crumb incubators could afford. Dirt was everywhere. We already know these cowpokes aren't big on hygiene. Those bedrolls were not used just on the trail, but on the ranch. But defer judgment for a minute. We've got guys and gales in the present splashing three seconds of tap water over their hands in public restrooms because washing them takes too long. Imagine how tough it would have been to convince a bunch of surly dudes with leather skin to take time out of their six hours of not-on-a-horse time that they get each day to change their underwear, comb their hair, wash their armpits, and air out those bed rolls. That isn't to say that cowboys were allergic to cleanliness. One of the things a traveling cattle wrangler had to look forward to was the nice hot bath he was going to sink into when he reached the next town. Cowboying is a dirty, dirty job. The boys in the back rode in a perpetual cloud of dust kicked up by the herd. The boys up front were marginally cleaner, but the uncompromising, unair conditioned hellscape that makes up so much of the American West, the battle of man versus dirt is a losing one for man. This holds true even on the homestead, where they at least had bunkhouses. Mind you, the cowboyest cowboys didn't pussyfoot around with that fit faddle. They slept under the stars. The best part of writing cowboy lines is the nigh endless menu of colorful metaphors at your disposal. The not-so-secret code of the cowpuncher gives us a front row seat for the everyday doings of those dudes. It's full of task-specific phrases, regional words borrowed from the vaquero tradition and nearby Native American nations, and of course, lots and lots of expletives. For instance, a cowboy, or bull nurse, under gastric distress might exclaim on his way to the latrine, I'm fixing to get a new bean, Master Buggum. I got the blam jam backdoor trots again. A conversation between two cowboys might go like this. Fetch me some of that joy juice, Ed. I'll fetch you a punch in the nose, Ted. Go boil your shirt. I'm too dragged out to mind your john tonight. Some of these are so bizarre they warrant a triple take. A Bible bump, for instance, was a cyst on the back of the hand or wrist that old codgers believed could be treated by thumping it really hard with a heavy book. Lacking Harry Potter, most folks so inclined reached for the word and commenced to whackin'. Many a granite-faced buckaroo has graced screens big and small in the iconic ensemble of equal parts hide, wool, and grit. And yes, of course they had sweet cowboy names for every piece of it. First things first, cowboys are clicky. Unless you want to be taken for a down east tenderfoot, don't wear anything that looks like it might be new. Start with blue jeans or California trousers and the most tenacious shirt you can find. You're going to be wearing it every day and baths will be catch as catch can. Next, you've got your bat wings, chaps, although technically, chances are you're a Mexican or Spanish cattle herder if you do. Worn over your pants, chaps protect your legs from the brush, scouring winds, and rattlesnakes that make prairie life so much fun for the nobody. A bandana around your neck can be pulled up over your blowholes when the dust situation gets out of control. Your Stetson hat had better be a big one if you want to break from the sun. The bigger, the better. If all else fails, go with a sombrero. No one will laugh at you. Not if they felt the oil on their skin cooking like a baked potato under the desert sun. Finally, you've got your Justins, the tough, knee-high leather boots that form the last line of defense against everything that wants to kill you. More thought goes into cowboy boots than you might expect if you got introduced to them at a hayride or a steakhouse. Narrow toes and heels help your fit to fit securely in a stirrup, but still allow for enough freedom of movement to dismount. If you want to be able to prod your horse along or come off super menacing when you meet new people, just add a shiny pair of hell rousers. These days, we can enjoy a cornucopia of Western comedies. Cowboys did some mighty silly things in modern eyes. 
but way back then, it was an undeniably badass profession. Contemporaries heralded their courage, physical alertness, ability to endure exposure and fatigue, horsemanship, and skill in the use of the lariat. And so do we. Cowboys had to be pretty beefy to take on tasks like breaking horses, roping cattle, and riding for hours on end through great danger and greater discomfort. But they also had to be clever. The utter balls necessary to chase a stampeding herd or brave some of America's douchiest elements on a regular basis had to be supplemented by the knowledge required to make quick decisions, care for the cattle, and keep one's head in the face of disaster. They also had to be able to understand basic cow psychology. Years of experience taught a cowboy what a cow might react to and how, aiding him in the various butt-puckering emergencies that come with the job, like river crossings and landslides. There's no room for carelessness or laziness on the trail. Refer to your cinematic trivia and you'll recall that the crime for stealing a horse in the Wild West was death by hanging. At first glance, the death penalty might seem harsh and a wee taste crazy punishment for grand theft equine, but horses were far more important to them than cars are to us. Losing your horse could mean losing your livelihood and with it, your life. Cowboys depended on their faithful steeds to travel, guard, protect, and haul on cattle drives. The horse had to be able to handle long hours with riders on their backs over difficult terrain in ungodly heat, and the riders cared for them with surprising tenderness, developing bonds that unified steed and rider with centaur-like cohesion. The best horses made up the Ramuda, a collection of even-tempered equines thought to understand cows as well as their riders could. Cowboys could make anywhere from $25 to $40 a month. That's $500 to $800 by today's money, which was livable scratch for single men without families to support or rent to pay. They'd spend their earnings on good times, good company, and good stuff when they got to town. Although flashy purchases would have been a social suicide, conscientious cowpokes saved their wages so they could buy land and cattle of their own. They were also surprisingly fair. On the ranch and on the road, cowboys made the same wage regardless of ethnic or racial background. And that was especially good because the American cowboy owes his origin to Mexican and Spanish rancher traditions. During the 1700s, vaqueros, derived from vaca, the Spanish word for cow, were hired by Spanish ranchers to work the land and tend to their cattle. Vaqueros were native Mexicans who had expertise in roping, herding, riding, the full rawhide badass resume. By the 1800s, waves of European immigrants had made their way west and began to work as cowboys as well. No longer a strictly Mexican vocation, there was a lot of diversity among cowboy groups. African Americans, Native Americans, and settlers from all around Europe worked with vaqueros, often picking up the skills they needed to thrive and survive along the way. In this profession, just surviving without getting caught grabbing your saddle horn was an indication that you had a knack for this gig. The remoteness of cowboy life promoted a sense of egalitarianism that transcended ethnic and racial differences. After all, all men are fair game for sunstroke, cholera, and snake bites. And if you can survive those, you've earned your stripes in accordance with the man code. It took 8 to 12 cowboys to move 3,000 head of cattle. Groups of young men traveled great distances together, led by a trail boss, an experienced cow puncher who decided how many miles the drive would tackle in a day and where they camped at night. A second-in-command, or segundo, a cook, and several wranglers rounded out the group. Contrary to what Hollywood would have us believe, there was very little wagon circling going on. Groups were an unappealing target for Native American war parties. Stragglers, on the other hand, were so vulnerable to attacks and the elements that it was all but suicide to go it alone. And by the same token, lone cowboys evoked fear and suspicion when they were spotted out on the plain. There was and is no telling what crazy cowboys might do, and crazy is the very best descriptor for anyone wandering the desert without backup. The myth of the cowboy and his trusty pair of six shooters comes to us direct from Hollywood, but the rest of his arsenal does not. There were hundreds of kinds of guns used by cowboys during their heyday. Most men favored a short sidearm and a longer rifle, a good combination for almost any occasion. Now, cowboys did typically go about healed, armed, but those guns were meant not for confrontations or quarrels, but for protection. You might have to fend off wolves and coyotes, hostile natives or potential thieves, but guns were primarily used to stop a cowboy's worst nightmare from unfolding, a stampede. A stampede spelled ultimate disaster, and cowboys did everything they could to avoid it. Any one of a million things could spook the herd. A pistol shot, a storm, a snake, a robust fart. But once a stampede got going, it was up to the cowboys to ride to the front of the herd and bring it under control. 
After the cowboys ran to their horses and hopefully avoided getting trampled on the way, they had to navigate thousands of pounds of beef coming straight at them. As cowboys moved alongside the herd, they ran the risk of falling or being straight up knocked off their horses, either of which could mean a swift but painful death. The horse itself could be brought under by the herd, something that usually resulted in both horse and rider being mangled to sausage meat, as was the case for one Idahoan caballero in 1889. Cowpoke Teddy Blue recalled a stampede in 1876 wherein a man and his horse were killed. The horse's ribs were scraped bare of hide, and all the rest of the horse and man was mashed into the ground as flat as a pancake. Thanks to the ever-present threat of dysentery, cholera, and other bullshit diseases we managed to get ahead of in the intervening years, and without refrigerators or other products of modern-day sorcery, there wasn't much variety in a cowboy's diet. Chuck wagons accompany cattle drives and cooks, legendarily grumpy but beloved companions, serve staple foods like beef, bacon, beans, bread, and coffee. Cowboys typically ate twice a day, once in the morning and again in the evening. Most cowboys weren't gluttonous, eating enough to get full but not overindulging for fear of an upset stomach, not fun on horseback, or running out of provisions on a long drive. Cowboys rose with the sun, so they weren't prone to staying up late, but that doesn't mean they didn't love a good time. They spent their evening hours telling stories and socializing with their co-workers around a campfire. They played fiddles or harmonicas, told jokes, mostly blue, anything to decompress after a long, hot, dusty day in the saddle. When they were on watch, cowboys talked to their cattle like Disney princesses, telling them stories or soothing them with songs. The songs were made up on the spot or handed down from cowboy to cowboy, usually perpetuating a tall tale or expounding on some aspect of that cowboy life. A cowboy who could sing was expected to. Anything to ward off boredom before grabbing those three hours of sleep before the next leg of the trip. So would you want to be a cowboy in the Wild West? Let us know in our comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our weird history.